let's try this again. Okay. Get, back. <laughs> get it onto all of our pages. Give us a minute here as we are mm, we're yes. going back in. And uh, let's see here. Show to a page. Okay. We were trying a different program and it cut out their server uh -huh. chopped off. And I won't say anything about that. No. It's his fault. I never no. had problems till he got on. No, no, no. I said we need to go to this one, and you said no. But it's okay. I, I will not say I told you so. No, you won't. Because I would never do that. <laughs> all right. Share. You all there? If you if you are there, give us thumbs up or the heart button or something. There we go. And if you could hear us, okay. Okay. You are there? Yeah. Okay, I think we got it. All right, we're good. <laughs> okay. okay, so you want to start this time? No, I don't. You were talking about not being anxious and not giving into anxiety, mm -hmm. especially if you're atmospherically sensitive and recognizing that you're sensing an atmosphere Yeah. and not to feed it. Yeah, so I think even if you're not the kind of person who's prone to that, and um, I, think some, I think everybody right now is some, one way or another waking up, maybe feeling anxious or thinking about the future or different things like that, you just need to keep in mind that um, you know, a lot of that is not even yours, but even if you pick it up and it's not yours and you begin to feed on it and you begin to think through that, uh, you begin to actually water a seed that comes into your heart for anxiety. So I think it's really important for us right now, whether you have some legitimate things to be considering and be wondering if uh, what's gonna happen with it. It's, you know, There's some natural anxiety that comes but uh, either way, I think it's an important time for us to focus on the word, uh, put the word down in our heart about what God says. And, you know, it says be anxious for nothing, right? So God would never tell us to do something that he would enable us to do it. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God will come. So you have to always remember that uh, peace is not always circumstantial, no. uh, but peace is internal. Peace is because of the kingdom of God in you. And we can't rely on circumstances around us to bring us peace. So the king, the, the kingdom in us is what brings us peace. So I think no matter what's going on in the world, mm -hmm. I think um, the Holy Spirit is on the inside of us. And we could always reside and press into the peace of God in our life. That's right. I catch right. myself, you know, I, I, I'm i pretty good at, uh, you know, these kinds of situations and circumstances. Because, you know, we've been in ministry for so long. Been through well, Y2K. we're young, we're young, but long time. <laughs> Y2K and recession and lots of different things. So, you know, mm -hmm. we've built the muscle for it at this stage. Although, I'm not saying it's easy, it's we haven't dealt with this kind of this kind of topic before. Yeah. Uh, but the, the principles are the same. But I, I catch myself, you know, uh, you know, sometimes I'll the, the thought of worry will start to enter my heart and I will stop myself. And I'll say, put your trust in God. That's right. And I will just, you know, make sure that I'm keeping connection with the Holy Spirit. And that's something I want to encourage everybody is to be aware of your connection with the Spirit of God. It really is mm -hmm. a feeling of trust. And it is a sense of, of, of union and oneness uh, with Him. And you can actually just, just stop what you're doing right now and mm -hmm. just, just say, I put my trust in you. And yeah. since that that connection and perhaps a reconnection if you pulled away in fear or anxiety because fear is a spirit yeah, is. and and you can actually divert yourself to the voice of another spirit if you're not mm -hmm. aware um, and not intentional um, so so I just want to encourage you that that God God is helping us he's yeah. he's right here mm -hmm. um, you know this is this is a battle we're gonna win and I know for myself, you know, he's been steadily giving me prayer points. That's yeah. that's what's been happening with me. It's like, okay, uh, for these this day or a few days or, you know, a handful of days, he'll say this is what the focus is. And so I've been really pressing into Micah 2.13 message version where he bursts us out of confinements and into an open place. But the key phrase of that whole passage is we're being led by the king. Yeah. So again, keeping our eyes on him, letting him lead us, whatever area is being impacted, whether mm -hmm. uh, you're concerned about your provision or your health or whatever, keeping our eyes on him, which means keeping our eyes on the word and what happens, what's the end result? He bursts us out of the confinement. He, right. 
He brings us to an open place, which is personally, internally, as well as once we get out of quarantine, you know. Yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah and I think, yeah. I think just your words are important right now. Yeah. And what you confess, mm -hmm. what you declare. And I think it's important for you to hear yourself declaring the promises of God. And um, I, there's a bunch of declarations I make every morning. I actually posted just a few of them this morning on my Facebook page. So if you go on my Facebook page, uh, you'll see some uh, declarations. And probably tomorrow morning after I declare mine, I'll post some more of them. But uh, I think it's really important right now that you just align your mouth and your heart and your faith and um, just begin to release those words of faith into the atmosphere right now. Do you ever wonder if this is, uh, you know, it, it's like Satan will come to test the church, mm -hmm. but God is also doing the same. You know, yeah. it, you know what it's like? It's, mm -hmm. it's a very much a dual thing. It's like, yeah. like both heaven and hell are watching what yeah. the church does in this hour. Yeah, the enemy's test is to destroy you. God's test is to promote you. Yeah, and so yeah. Um, it, it's this is where we together, coming together and making the best of the situation, mm -hmm. helping one another, praying for one That's another, right. but collectively in faith, not backing down, yeah. not giving up, not giving in, yeah. and being patient. And yeah. just let by your by your patience possess your soul. Oh, that's good. You know, and that's that's what the scripture says, you know, by your patience yeah. you possess your soul. Um and, and you, you refuse to allow, you know, worry and mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the media and you know, the negative media uh tell you some of your friends. Yeah, some of your friends, you know. Uh, some friends need to, to be shushed for a little while, yeah. perhaps. <laughs> Socially so, distance them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, oh yeah, but you got some questions. <laughs> we d we do. Um, uh, some of them. I'm not sure if any of it relates to what's going on right now, and that's okay because that tells us people are are not just fixated on um, this pandemic that we are we are we are overcoming right now. Mm -hmm. um, so these are some different questions. Um, the first question is, how do you balance work and rest? What are some ways to be intentional with rest? Uh, without being lazy. Right, I think it kind of goes with that first one though. How okay. do you cope with stress and pressure in leadership? Yeah, okay. How do you cope with stress and pressure in leadership? I'm Work and rest and yeah. all of that. Um, for the most part, um, stress is not, I know my body feels it, mm -hmm. but I've, again, with this much time and with so many things we've had to overcome and deal with, it's almost like I, I feel when it comes to stress, for the most part, I don't really intern. I don't really take it on. Mm -hmm. My body will react. Um, I'll notice things physiologically that oh Such hey as. I I have stress right now. Um, you know I just I just won't feel right or I'll I'll you know I'll just notice I'm not on my game. Um, you know those kind of things. I just maybe I'll get a stomach ache or or a headache or something. Or but, start itching. You itch? Do you, I, I don't used itch. to in college, and I had a lot of stress. Okay. I would itch. I don't, like I don't itch. Uh, so, no, but the skin issues is a common thing with oh, stress. for stress. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I mean, I'll take note of that. Um, this is probably the first time ever that I've ever thought about. Hey, I need to incorporate a little bit more rest. Um, there's mm -hmm. a lot of reasons behind that, and it's not because I'm breaking down. It's because I'm leaving space for processing. That's yeah. this season. I felt like I need space to process things. And so I'm building in rest for myself, um, but but I seem to do better if I'm in motion. You know that that seems to work for me, mm -hmm. um, because my mind is always going so fast. So so I think it goes. I, I try not to put my my lifestyle on others, and I appreciate when they don't put it on me. Some people they assume I'm tired because I carry a load that they are not called to carry. You know, and so I have to sometimes bring some some communication on that. It's like I'm I'm I don't I I'm given a grace from the Lord to carry what I'm supposed to carry, yeah. and I don't expect you to carry it. But I'm not I, I'm not tired because I'm carrying it. So yeah. that's something I have to explain to people. Yeah, and I think when it comes to stress, it says you know how do you cope with stress and pressure and leadership? Mm -hmm. First of all, if you're going to lead anything, you're going to have stress. So yeah, you know that's. There's no such thing as a stress-free uh, world, and let alone a stress-free you know, leadership. But I think you have to also define the difference between good stress and bad stress. You know, uh, there's a lot of good stresses, and 
you know, you're getting married, that's a good stress, right? Uh, you know, your church is growing and you're ministering to people, you know, those are good stresses. Um, but the bad stress is the stress that's toxic. So it's the stress of, you know, negative things happening in your life and, and uh, having to, uh, you know, deal with stuff that's really uh, ha having a bad effect on your emotions and, and things mm -hmm. like that. So that's the toxic stress that you have to deal with. And uh, so those are the things that you have to kind of determine that you're just going to put, uh, you'll, you'll deal with what you could deal with and the rest you're just going to put out of your mind. You know, I think for me, for a lot of years, I had a hard time dealing with um, the toxic stress. Yeah. I think there was a lot of things that I would take very personal and it would emotionally really affect me. I think in recent years, I've really learned how to deal with that so much better. Uh, number one, realizing I'm not, I, I can't control everything. I'm not no. in charge of everything. Yeah. I can't, I can't determine mm -hmm. the outcome to all, for a lot of stuff. And then the other thing just comes down to you just trust God. Mm -hmm. You trust that you do your part, you do what's best, and then you let God take care of the rest. I think one of the mantras I've been saying for the last few years, kind of repeating to myself and some of our staff is, I, I do everything that I know is right to do, and then I divorce myself from the outcome. Yeah. In other words, what, what happens as a result or what people do as a result of what I do, but if I know I've done the right thing, uh, the rest is not up to me. And uh, I think that's a big part of the stress thing. Mm -hmm. I think one thing that I've shared with some young pastors recently is uh, if I could go back 20 years or 23 years, whatever's been up in senior pastoring, if I could go back to that person, to that Ron, and give him any one advice, I would say to him, uh, not everything is such a big deal. So don't take everything as such a big deal. Yeah, one of the things I internally tell myself is um, it's not personal when when somebody acts funky mm -hmm. um, even if it is personal on their end it's not my problem don't make it personal. yeah it's like it's like that's not my problem that's their problem I do my best to mm -hmm. to be kind and do the right thing but it's yeah. not personal I think we all need to say that why don't you say that right now it's, it's not, not personal. personal you know just I'm not gonna take that personal that'll really help you unless it's your wife take it personal. yeah 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 <laughs> Are you texting? I am because I need some water. My throat is like, I, I ran really hard. and so I you're didn't texting for water? I am. I'm asking for somebody to bring me well, some water. So. They're going to need a key to get <laughs> so, out. Uh, so anyway, um, to, so anyway that, that's one of the things that I do. It's not, it's not personal. Um, what advice would you give someone who feels called to be a senior pastor but works outside of the church? Is that for me? Well... Yeah, uh, to you. I would say pastoring is not a vocation. Pastoring is your calling. Yeah. So some people are privileged enough to, in a season of their life, to be able to uh, pastor without being a senior pastor without having to have another job outside of that. Others, for right now or for a season, pastor and, like the Apostle Paul, make tents yeah. to pay for their calling. So... Uh, I think you have to look at it as, first of all, it's not um, it's not a job, it's a calling on your life. So you would do it either way, whether you're um, getting paid or not getting paid. Right. Because a lot of times I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll look at guys and I'll say, you know, if they're not on staff or they're not at that church anymore, we'll see if they're still involved in church. Exactly. That's we'll, how you know. We'll see if they're still doing <laughs> ministry. You know, it's like, it's funny, a lot of pastors, you know, so once they're not, quote, on staff or they're not at the church anymore, boom, they just become not even a good church attender anymore. Yeah. You know, and so it's like, okay, well, were you doing it for the job or is it a calling on your life? Yeah. So I would just say be faithful to where you are and realize that it doesn't change anything based on whether uh, you're doing it full time, vocationally or not, that God is the one who promotes you. God will take care of it and just be faithful where you are. And I know it's hard balancing it all, but you know if that's the season you're in, God will give you the grace. Hey, that's that's water. I, would you like? To, I can't even open. I'll the open thing. it for you. Just Thank but you. make sure we don't leave garbage in my office. Always, every every day. My kids call me a clean freak, but I'm really not. I know you're not. It's my, it's my, <laughs> I, my space has to be clean. That I get. I understand that. Yeah. I so. I hate paper. I hate clutter in my so, spaces. So don't I clutter. Okay. Right. Um. Where do you see the church 
in 20 years? Uh, oh, boy. Where did I see it in 20 years? This church? Or just the church? Oh, uh, this church? I see it not in my hands in 20 years. <laughs> okay. Somebody else is going to be carrying this thing in see? 20 years. Yeah, they'd have to. Yeah, because I'll be... Like, I'm done. 69. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to keep doing this at 69. You have to... Uh, you're ready to pass it off. Yeah, no, honestly, I, I think if we're talking about this church, mm -hmm. I would say, you know, actually a few years ago, I started talking to our elders about a contingency plan and succession planning, not only contingency, but succession planning. And, um, and they thought I was crazy because I was in my early to mid 40s when I started talking to them about it, about they're like, you're crazy. Because, you know, most of them, that I'm all they've known in terms of, pastoring this church yeah. and uh, I say wait a minute guys I don't plan to do this forever and ideally I would like 10 years with the next person who's going to take over for me and I said so really that's not that much time and I think reality kind of began to set in a little mm -hmm. bit so we've already been thinking about it and planning on it but I think another element right now we have to kind of look at is as we're planting more and more campuses is how does that going to look like in mm -hmm. 20 years yeah. You know, we're going to have a bunch of campuses, uh, way more than we even plan right now uh, in 20 years. But at that point, is it still going to be one big church or is it going to be um, a lot of little ones? A lot, a lot of little ones. You and know? a lot of, a lot of online churches because, you know, yeah. this this season forced the issue. Yeah. You know. So, um, yeah. So it's going to obviously be different. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be, we're going to have a lot more campuses. So that's one thing. We're going to be all over the place, up and down to 99 and some other places too. Um, but so then, if you really, it's about raising the next generation of leaders. That's what it's about. Then I don't see how you're going to get out of this in 20 years if you're going to put all that. <laughs> I'm getting out somehow. I got an exit plan. <laughs> okay. So he's he's planning big, but he's pla he's like you, you're all <laughs> these plans, and you're like, oh, but I'm getting out. I'm not. It's like you're talking out of both sides. <laughs> Don't I do that all the time? Yeah, you do it all the time. Like I say, I'm never going to like do another church plan. I'm never going to do another building program. <laughs> and I always do one. So we don't know what we're doing. Okay. Yeah. Um, so where do you see the church? Um, yeah, that's a good question. The, the technology piece of it is uh, um, that's something mm -hmm. that you cannot ignore uh, as, as far as a church is going. Uh, yeah. Technological. Actually, it makes you... Pastor, it makes you so mobile. Um, it makes you so invasive on a whole lot of levels. Well, there, there's challenges to it, but there's mm -hmm. a lot of um, opportunity with it too. Right. Yeah. And so, um, so that's one of the things that I see is just the absolute mm -hmm. investment in technology and uh, really reaching the younger generation. Um, you know, like, oh, what was I looking at yesterday? Mm -hmm. I was like, what's this TikTok thing? TikTok. You know, tick tock, <laughs> tick tock. And I just know about tick tock. Yeah. I so immediately I turned to our youth pastor. I'm like, what the heck is tick tock? What do is tick tock? Do I need to be on tick tock? And he's like, I've got a tick tock account. What is it? Well, it's a generation Z media medium. Social media. Yes. yes. So yes. it's not like, so it's not breath mints then. No, no, it's right. tick tock and it's all video. And so, so video. anyway, interesting. Yeah. So, so anyway, I'm just getting ready for or for the next, uh, the, the, the next one, perhaps, you know. Yeah, but <laughs> things are going to be different after mm -hmm. this whole yeah. Corona thing with how the churches have had to change how we do things. Yeah. Things will be very different. And uh, if, you are, if you follow me on Facebook um, and Instagram, mm -hmm. I actually posted at both places a, a video, a prophetic uh, word by somebody that we know, uh, mm -hmm. Michael Maiden, who's a... Uh, we trust him very yeah. much prophetically. Mm -hmm. He's a great man of God out of Arizona. And the Lord gave him a dream, gave him a word. And one of the things that really struck me from that, I just really, I know it's already been shared over 200 times just off my Facebook, but yeah. if you haven't seen it, go on there and look at it. But it, one of the things he says in it that really gripped me is the Lord says, things will be different after this, but they'll be better. Right. Things will be different and they'll be better. So I think that is so true for the church. Mm -hmm. Things are going to be different. We're, we we're not going no church no church is going to survive going back to how church was prior to this but things will be better if we take advantage of the opportunities that are in front of us right um this one was for me um regarding the the gift of discerning of spirits how do you keep from being overwhelmed 
by what you are feeling and discerning. Yeah, especially in this season, because mm-hmm. I would wake up feeling the atmosphere of anxiety, and I knew that I knew it was not mine because I was at peace inside. Um, I absolutely knew, but it felt like a blanket of of you know anxiousness that was just you know very oppressive. And so um, because of who I am and what the Lord's called me to do, I just start looking to the Lord and say, what is your word? And that's when, you know, the dreams started coming and the words started coming that uh, as suddenly as this came, it will suddenly end. And, you know, so that that tells me there's an end point. um, And uh, I know that there is a future and a hope. And I know, I understand principles that, that, you know, you can, if you hear the Lord, you can sow in famine and come out of this more prosperous than before. Um, So, you know, just, just giving those principles and pushing those principles out. And, and I think one of my roles uh, is in our roles, the leaders roles, especially right now, you know, spiritual leaders is to keep the church in faith. Um, And that's why we're, we're just so online right now is we've got to, we've got to, uh, fight, fight media with media in a sense. Yeah. You know, it, it really is an airways war, mm. um, and so uh, uh, just really saturate the airways with faith, yeah. not negativity, not th- not, not fear, not yeah, panic, not fear, not panic. hysteria. Yeah, because you'll notice. If you want that, just watch CNN. <laughs> yeah, I, I I saw some uh, someone posted a news clip, and they were talking about different nations. You know how they were handling the virus, but they showed the same photo, but it was supposedly tagged for this nation and then another nation. Mm-hmm. But it was the same photo, so that tells you the doctoring yeah. um, of of media. Well, panic sells news. So yeah. that's why they do it. Yeah, and so I was just like, you know, so we've got to saturate with the truth, which is yeah. the word of God, which is the sword yeah. of the Lord. Um, and so, so that's what I've been doing to, you know, to not get overwhelmed. But, but I'm I'm skilled in this, so I know I understand it. I I can feel uh, an atmospheric oppression. And for the most part, not go under with it because I'm, I'm already solid inside. So you have to really get solid inside and be be rock steady inside because you know the word. Um, if you need extra help, get my book, Seeing the Supernatural. You can you can just get it on um, uh, like Amazon or any of those. Get it on Kindle, uh, audio, um, paperback, whatever you want. But um, That sounds like a commercial. It is a commercial. Where, because, your, where your favorite books are sold. Yeah, see, Seeing the Supernatural. <laughs> Because that'll help you it'll with help. this gift. It'll it'll show you how to walk it out really yeah. well, and and not go under. Uh, yeah. For those of you who are who are uh, Cause, sensitive, because like it's that. meant it's meant to be a weapon and a blessing. Right, right. The gift of discerning spirits. Yeah. It's not meant to to overwhelm you. But if you don't understand it, you yeah. don't know how to manage it. Um, it won't. It, this will this will turn turn on you instead of yeah. actually be a blessing in you and through you. Yeah. Um, I think this is a good question. Go for it. One of my favorites. Uh, during a church service, how do you balance following the flow of the Holy Spirit without totally throwing out the structure set in place for the service? This is fun. This is the funnest question ever. Tell them why it's fun. It's fun because we're you know because we have three services between two different campuses on Sunday morning. We have to have timers because we've got to get people out of the parking lot, empty our parking lots, and. And there's a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of... I have to travel a lot. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of moving parts, and it works really well until he gets, like, anointed more than normal. I was going to say, when I get anointed. When you get anointed more than normal. Thanks for clarifying that. Okay, and you blow the timers. And then we're like, we don't know what to do. And so, because we're, it's it's very, you know, we're, we're structured, and then, but we have permission to flow in the Holy Spirit... But it, it's still one of those things. It's like we're. I think that we probably do better than a lot of people because. But at the same time, I think we're still learning it. I think we're still learning. Yeah, I think I think this has been attention for us for yeah. twenty years. Yeah, <laughs> attention for twenty years. Even back when we had one service and not three services on two campuses. Yeah. Um, and it's gonna be a couple more campuses here in just the next few months. Yeah. So it's gonna be a whole other dynamic. But right. it's been attention for us. Just I think partly yeah. in terms of our giftings and but but also partly in, in terms of our desire um, on the one hand you know um, Jen, Jen and I always want the same thing we go for the same thing but I think we see things different we approach things different right. at times so sometimes that's been a good tension between us in terms of how we do things even how s- something is structured right so I think it's a good tension and um, so our value has always been how do you 
never compromise the flow of the Holy Spirit. Because, you know, honestly, you could do church without the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You could even grow a church without the Holy Spirit. But what good is it? Right? It's just, it's just a bunch of talking to the soul. You yeah. Know, kind it's, of a, stuff. it's a soul service. And, you know, the, the Lord does more in a minute in the Spirit yeah. than we could do talking to the soul. But again, some people, you know, it's better, I guess, than nothing, right? Yeah. You go, go to yeah. a soul church. <laughs> The soul church. Anyway, so... <laughs> a lot of soul. 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 Speaking to the soul, not not having soul. Anyway, so... Um, so we want we value the flow of the Holy Spirit, but at the same time, I think a lot of the crazy that happens is not the Holy Spirit. Right. It's people's personality or thinking is the Holy Spirit. And, uh, you know, because I think that enemy really wants people to think that, you know, if you have the Holy Spirit and you're acting like a nut and... Kind of scares people away from that and all that but you know the holy spirit doesn't make uh -huh. you crazy the holy no. spirit just uh, makes you who you are you know kind of it's kind actually, of thing yeah. right but he empowers who you are mm -hmm. he anoints who you are so uh so we want the holy spirit but we don't want the crazy so and the thing is like for example our service because we're known i think not only in our community but around the place as a very charismatic church signs and wonders and all that mm -hmm. so sometimes people think that like we're hanging off the chandeliers and handling snakes and all that probably yeah but then when they come into our service they actually see it so structured uh you feel the order yeah you feel the order uh -huh. that they're amazed by yeah. it because our thing is we want the holy spirit whether in our worship and our preaching and everything we do we want to know what the holy spirit is saying and doing but at the same time we're not going to let anybody else hijack the service right so um so that you have to have, I think the Holy Spirit actually flows more effectively within structure. Uh, I think, you know. It's, it's the banks, yeah. the river banks. So I was, you know, yeah. when I talk to the leaders, I always, you know, say that is, is the mm -hmm. banks, you know, if, if you have a river flowing and if you have banks to the river, you could actually direct this uh, river with power to go to a certain place. Right. But if you have no banks, which is your structure, the water is great, but it just floods everything and it's not really being effective going anywhere. So, uh, so you have to have the structure and you have to have the Holy Spirit. So banks without water is nothing. It's not, you know, it's dry. Yeah. But then water without the banks, you just flood it's, and you're not going anywhere. Yeah, it's not. So it's a tension you're always going to have. You got, you have to, you're never going to get it perfect, but you have to strive for that tension and uh, yeah, I do think, your best. I think the tension is what actually makes it work because yeah. then you have to think of, through things. It's, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I've been in so many different churches and I've seen some leaders, they actually stir up the crazy because they want yeah. a sense of something in the room. Because um, they think that's anointing. Yeah, and, and stirring up the crazies is not is not the anointing, it's stirring up the crazy. I mean, that's yeah. that's insanity. I've been in places like, like this is insanity. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't necessarily lend to kingdom order that mm. that uh, causes changes and shifts and transformations. Because no. so, some, some, I think some leaders make the mistake thinking that the crazier it is, then the more mystic or supernatural it is. Uh -huh. So therefore, somehow it's more supernatural and godly. Yeah. I think the thing you have to keep in mind also is we want the supernatural. We want the signs and wonders. Of course, that's that's nothing that we minimize, water down, or hide. Yeah. But at the same time, you have to realize that when the supernatural is flowing, it yeah. has to also have the language of translating to non-believers and all sorts of people right that actually draws them closer to jesus what's the sign and wonder it's a sign for people that points to jesus and his reality sure but if it's just crazy it's not uh, pointing to jesus yeah and you know and i can easily clarify that it's like uh we you know we have people come in who come in because they've had dreams mm -hmm. um you know and that's why they ended up in the church because because the Lord visited them in a dream, or they had angelic encounters, yeah. or they see angels in our service and healings in our service. But at the same time, there is this sense of order. It's just, mm -hmm. it's. I love the blend of it, yeah. and I love the tension of it. Um, you know, and you'll never be able to put a rule book on it. You have yeah. to, you have to listen to the Spirit yeah. of God and examine the results. And we, uh, and we have two. We have like, we have a pretty large church, so yeah. we have we have people on. I wouldn't say totally different spectrums, because. Yeah. If you're totally on one spectrum, you wouldn't fit. But we have people on different sides of the spectrum. Definitely. We have people that are more, they love the Holy Spirit, but they're more conservative and mm -hmm. they're more structured. And we have others that are just... Very mystical. Very mystical. <laughs> but 
they live together in harmony because because of the structure because of the, structure. Because of the order that we have yeah um what is one mistake you, they said one what is one mistake you have learned from in leadership That's learned a, from uh, yeah the, or made so it's not made what is one mistake you have learned from in leadership and they said one just one <laughs> One hundred, like maybe one hundred. One thousand. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, you go first. One mistake. Um, I would say ignoring what I've discerned. Mm. Ignoring what I've yeah. discerned. Um, for a while there, there was a big um, push, and it had. Uh, now that I, now that I, on this side of it, I, I recognize what it was. Um, but there was a big push. Uh, I would, I would call it the fallacy of hyper grace. Um, you know, there's grace, there's God's grace and grace, uh, is, is something that, that covers you as you are working out a problem. Uh, if you're, if you feel like you're failing, Jesus is failing people, but your heart wants to do right. Mm -hmm. Um, grace is what covers you in that season. I think many of us have had those seasons, multiple seasons. I know I have, um, but it's not a loophole. Okay. And that's the difference. It's not a loophole. And there was a big push to, to where, you know, it's almost like you didn't have to repent for anything. Uh, you know, there was just no responsibility to restore, responsibility to even uh, make things right. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of the, the you know, the fringe of, of hyper grace stuff. And so what, what it causes, it causes people to shut their eyes to discernment. Yeah. Um, you know, discerning the heart motives of people. And as a pester, uh, you do discern what's coming into your church you discern what's in your church so that you can be as redemptive as possible but you also have to you know you also have to watch for the wolves mm -hmm. and when that comes in you it doesn't always have to be a wolf it could be no. just a wounded, wounded shape that wounds people right and there's all different shades of this and you know i again with time you get skilled on how to handle this and you mm -hmm. know and work through it the most constructive as possible but um, the hyper grace, uh, you know, uh, push really caused people to close their eyes to a gift mm -hmm. of the spirit yeah. that was intended to protect. Um, and so, so that was the mistake I felt like I made for a season. And, and, but it was only a short season. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> when it hurts enough. Yeah, it was a short, it was a yeah. very, very short season. Because <laughs> so. yeah, when, you have, when you have grace without boundaries when you have too much grace that's lawlessness it is yeah and but if you have not enough grace that's legalism yeah so again we look at that tension again that, yeah. that tension jesus came and he was full of truth and grace yeah 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 how about you one mistake just you learned one. from? one oh my gosh just the know. one what can you name one that i learned from um i'll let you there's so many i'll let you so i think hers was definitely one yeah. And also for me, I think a story to go with that is, you know, one of the things for me is, you know, maybe I'm, I'm not, you know, the gift of discernment and all that. I don't talk about it. I'm not, I don't flow in it like she does. And, you know, of course she has a book out on it is, uh, but you know, I, I, I'm very discerning, but I think sometimes in the past anyway, I, I didn't realize I was discerning. Uh, and, yeah. uh, so what would happen is I would, um, override it override it because you know because of my leadership bent and then you know i remember, I remember john maxwell used to say you know always see a 10 on people believe in oh them. yeah put a 10 you know, on their put, head put a 10 on their head even if the the you know the one was kind of fading out yeah you really <laughs> saw the zero but anyway um you know put a 10 on their head and all that so what would happen is i would intentionally override my discernment as she was saying because i wanted to believe in people and uh, again, sometimes it's it's uh, discern, just watch out, mm -hmm. cut them out. Yeah. Other times it's hey, this person is wounded, so they will act out of their woundedness. So uh -huh. you got to be aware of that and yeah. try to bring healing to them if they're open. So uh, so I went to two, I went through two or three things over yeah. maybe just what was it three or four or five years? Yeah. That it seemed like wasn't necessarily the same thing, but it was similar things mm -hmm. where I had discernment about someone, but I just wanted to believe the best in them. And then it came back, not only hurting us, you know, that's, yeah. that's one thing, but it hurt the body and yeah. it brought confusion to people. And, you know, every time when there was somebody like that, 
they take out a few sheep with them in the sense of yeah. they ruin them or they wound them or just physically take them out. So, uh, so one day I remember I'm driving up to our house and I'm talking to myself. I do that all the time. And, and Jen will tell you I even answer myself. It's true. Because sometimes if I'm the only one in the car, I'm the smartest one in the car at that point. So I got to ask myself the question. I got to answer it. Anyway, so... Uh, that sounded terrible. But anyway, it does. <laughs> so, but, uh, so I was talking to myself and I'm just like saying man, Lord, give me the gift of discernment. Give me the gift of discernment. And uh, as I'm driving up to my driveway, I heard the Lord speak to me so clearly. And he said, I already have. Why do you think you've known about it each time before it's ever happened? happened. Mm -hmm. So I think it was not recognizing that I was operating already in discernment, but I was overriding it, not realizing that it was a gift from the Lord to Mm -hmm. protect his body and to protect me. Right. Rather than, again, a good thing but a soulish thing saying no I'm just going to believe the best in that right and uh and and not going that direction so I think so that's been one big thing and I think the other one uh I kind of alluded to it earlier I know we said one but uh, (laughs) I'll speak you back in on yours okay is uh is not make everything a big deal yeah most things are not a big deal um I think you learn that only after you get old and you do this for 20 some odd years yeah no drama. No drama. It's not everything is such a big deal. <laughs> deal with it. Deal with it righteously. Deal with it right. Mm-hmm. And then let it go. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't fuel it. Just let it go. And uh, God will take care of it. You know, time Time is the great equalizer. I was, you know, for years I always told our leaders, everyone is where they are for a reason. So if you give something enough time, you see the harvest of the seeds that you sow and the seeds that people sow. Right. So, um, yeah. Okay. What do you find most difficult about being a leader? Last question. You want to answer that or you want to answer it? Um, well, um, what I find most difficult is that, well, let's say this situation right now is where most people can kind of you know, go home and quarantine and kind of retreat, leaders have to leave. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you have to, we have to go forward as a leader and put out the, put the energy and, and the thinking and, and lead others through this. Sometimes you have to suspend your own emotions for a season, um, uh, because you have to lead through the trial or you have to lead through the pandemic and everything. You don't have time for a breakdown. Right. Mm -hmm. And so as a spiritual leader, as pastors and everything, um, you know, and I feel like I need to talk to some some pastors that that this is not the time to retreat and not be visible. Mm -hmm. And that's why I I can't tell you enough. You need to get on social media and encourage your community, even if your community is 100, um, you know, 20 or 20, because leaders lead. And so that's that's the tough part. You don't have the luxury of retreating like everybody else because you're not like everybody else. Yeah. So we, we need to see you and you need to be visible. That's where you That's belong. A good word. That's a good word. I think, you know, obviously there's a lot of things that yeah. are um, difficult. Is that the question? Yeah. Difficult yeah. In, in leading. But I, th- I think one thing that's uh, very real about mm-hmm. leadership, especially if you're, I think, the senior leader, whether it's mm-hmm. a senior pastor or if you're the CEO of a company or yeah. the owner of a business, is um, you're never off. So even if you're on vacation, you're really never off. That doesn't mean you're, you know, doing work, but I'm talking about carrying the load. Mm -hmm. I think one of the difficult things about leadership that is never really talked about when you're going through school, or actually you don't even know how to talk about it, but it's the whole aspect of you carry a load that no one else can carry. And, uh, and sometimes you'll feel like nobody else understands what you're going through and then you get frustrated uh, with your team or people around you Mm -hmm. and, but you have to realize that's your burden to carry. And uh, I just heard something really powerful a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm going to swipe it here. But okay. it was actually from Brett Allen, mm-hmm. uh, a friend of mine. I actually texted him and told him about it, mm-hmm. how powerful it was. But uh, mm-hmm. Brett was talking about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. How, you know, for years I used to look at that and say, man, these lazy, sleepy, you know, disciples, they could not tarry within one hour. Right? Yeah, like, can't you pray for an hour? Yeah, come on. Come on. I'm about to die for you. I'm <laughs> bleeding right now through my sweat, and you're asleep. 
and you know what terrible people <laughs> but uh, Brett something that said that he said that was so good he said the burden of the cross at that moment the burden of what Jesus was going through was only his to carry yeah it wasn't theirs so they were able to sleep mm -hmm. but he couldn't because it yeah. was his burden to carry right that was so framed because you know because the disciples obviously loved Jesus they were for him they uh, followed him they gave up everything for him they loved him but they were still asleep right not because they were un disloyal or anything like that it was just not yeah. their burden to carry so I think that's what we have to understand sometimes as a leader not everybody's gonna be able to carry things like you carry them because that's not their burden to carry right so I think one of the things I've seen over the 20 some odd years in pastoring is that uh, I see pastors become bitter and that's the number one way to just end your ministry mm -hmm. and end it all is be, let bitterness get on the inside of you but I, I see them get bitter because they feel other people fail them whether it's staff members or people in their congregation they feel like they didn't care for them like they needed to or they didn't help them like they needed to and they get bitter but you have to you have to realize it's not always because of that it's sometimes it's just not their burden to carry and you have to realize that there's because God's called you to leadership there's a certain burden that you carry, but he gives you the grace to carry it. Exactly. And you say, well, what, what's the plus side of doing that? You get to know God on levels mm -hmm. that others wouldn't because mm -hmm. something about carrying the burden, the load with the Lord uh, brings a presentation yeah. of, of his heart and his power and dimensions of the Holy Spirit that you don't get to encounter any other way. And so that that's the plus side is getting to know God yeah. on those levels. So so the you know it, 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 there's a reward yeah. to that to saying yes to that. Plus you have to see it as a privilege. Yeah, you have to see it as a privilege that the Lord will call would call you to carry part of the burden of His kingdom. Mm -hmm. You know, and what is the rewards for faithfulness? It's more responsibility. Yeah, for I, sure. I think in, in a culture that everybody's trying to run from responsibility, God says. <laughs> if you're faithful, I'll give you more responsibility. That's the kingdom. So, yeah. <laughs> so what does that mean? A lot of people in our culture today are actually running from the kingdom and kingdom promotion when God says, if you're faithful, I'll actually put more responsibility on you. Which, what does that mean? More responsibility means there's more burden that you have to carry that much of it you carry alone. Yeah. Well, yeah, but yeah. you get to see the Lord. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, I, that's what I always felt. I always totally. felt like... Uh, like the Lord reveals himself mm -hmm. on dimensions uh, revelatory dimensions because of it it's something about you press into him more so mm -hmm. that was our last question there was one that I kept on seeing you saw okay which was it's probably you should take it okay so uh, how do you break the spirit of rejection how do you break the spirit of rejection well I'm actually um, gonna do a, a very comprehensive discussion about that uh, through the online uh, inner healing and, and deliverance mini mini mm -hmm. sessions and that's at Jennifer Evaz online .com. Um, So I want to let you know but in a nutshell breaking the spirit of rejection you have to first come out of agreement with uh, the the lies that you have agreed to to reject yourself yeah. um, You have to come out of agreement and then we have to cast it out. I have found out that the spirit of rejection is actually a spirit it starts it starts with an attitude but it becomes and a wound. yeah and a wound but it, it actually opens the door to demonization yeah. and so then the the fruit of that demonization is the cycle of rejection yeah. that you're constantly in mm -hmm. and no matter what you do it's like the this rejection thing seems to stick to you um, and so we have to cast the demon out and get you out of agreement with the lie of it so so I'm actually gonna press into that and uh, like right now I'm, pre I'm working people through shame yeah it's really good stuff and then we'll do trauma and then we'll do rejection yeah. um, so that you can live out your purposes uh, the way God yeah. intended for you to live out so and I think a lot of people don't even realize uh -huh. they're acting out of the spirit of rejection they are yeah and and doing things you know to make sure that you get rejected again and again and again <laughs> so yeah. because of self-fulfilling prophecy yeah I think even for myself for a lot of years I didn't realize you know my core wound was rejection I thought it was a lot of other stuff mm -hmm. so I blamed a lot of other people for a lot of other stuff yeah but not realizing that it was a core wound of rejection that kind of 
everything flowed out of that. Yeah. And again, it's it's a long so it's there's a lot to it. A lot and, of layers. And Jen will be covering that. Yeah. But I think one of the things that really encouraged me with that is one number one, God could be totally trusted because I think when you have a spirit of rejection, one of the most destructive aspects of it is you don't fully trust God, and because you also transfer that over to the heavenly Father. Yeah. So I think for, for me it was, you know, telling God that. I choose to fully trust him until he shows himself untrustworthy. Right. You know, right. That's kind of like what a rejected person says, right? Yeah. <laughs> but but here's the thing with that is that God will always be faithful. God will never let yeah. you down. So I think that was that was one thing for me, just putting out there saying, Father, I, I choose to trust you in every situation mm -hmm. because I know he would never reject me. And I think and I think the other one is just also saying how much rejection Jesus went through. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Would you say Jesus was the most emotionally healthy person ever? Absolutely. And how 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 much rejection did he go through? All the time. I mean, his very birth was a rejection. Yeah. Right. Yeah. His uh, ministry was rejected. The cross was the ultimate rejection. Resurrection. People not believing he's resurrected. That's a rejection. But yet he was the most emotionally healthy person ever. So I think we could go through rejection and yet be very emotionally healthy. Mm -hmm. But number one, recognizing it if it's a wound and then dealing with it, as you said, as a spirit and not just simply an emotional deficit. Yeah, that, that one has, a, a, it's twofold. Yeah. And so we gotta, we gotta attack it from both those angles. Okay, thank you so much for joining us on our, on our live today. And we're just really um, excited to just join up with you uh, in this format and we look forward to doing it again. Okay, All right. bye guys. guys.